All right, so the question is, right now that we're gonna essentially explore is how much pressure parents should be putting on their children. And it's an interesting question because um, parenting is not an exact science. If it was any single parent, there would essentially be a Bible for parenting. There are loads of parenting books, and they're all slightly wrong um, because in the general sense of parenting, there isn't one right way to do it. There's multiple right ways, and this is where we kind of come to kind of the philosophy of the family or the parents. Um, because it really depends on you know who their personalities are. You know, if when it comes to children and stuff like that, everyone has like this designed personality that they possess, that they're essentially born with, and then over time, that personality is kind of enhanced in certain ways. You can think of it as something like wine, where you know the grapes that you get, it has a specific flavor. So when you're born, you have a personality of a specific flavor. And then as you grow older, it ages. Um, and that's an interesting analogy, because uh, if you age it with oxygen, or oxidized, ooh, that is not a good one. Uh, <laughs> but if it's properly stored, right, if it's properly pan uh, parented children, then they are going to turn out to be a fine one. And if, so there's no one way, one right way of parenting, but there's a lot of um, you go through the whole spectrum when it comes to how hard parents push their children. Uh, some parents are very uh, laissez-faire, where they really just let their children do whatever they want, um, whatever they desire. And having something like that is not necessarily um, beneficial to the child because when you're younger, you really don't have that self-control. If you don't have any rules in place, you really don't. Um, you really don't develop and grow and um, become your own person because there's a lot of things in life that is it's pretty much impossible to um, like stress and pressure or stress and um, essentially the negative feelings, right? If you're not if your parents don't put you into situations that are stressful, that um, are that don't, that are perfect, um, then there can be problems down the line. Jobs, you know, industry, you know, other aspects of life become really, really hard to cope with um, because the real world kind of sucks. Uh, there really isn't um, this like idealness of like everyone gets along, everyone doesn't get along, so you know, that there's always going to be uncomfortable feelings. And when it comes to laughing, their parenting, the children are experienced those rules in general and uh, can lead to, um, I don't know, it can lead to anxiety. But on the flip side of that, let's say, um, you always hear like uh, helicopter parents or tiger parents or other kinds of very, very strict parents when, which uh, they're, the parents want their kids to succeed. And that can also be a problem because, well, if you're putting so much pressure on their children doing, you know, with or succeeding or uh, duly well or whatever that means, um, then that's very outcome driven and that can lead to a lot of uh, um, instances of anxiety when things don't go perfectly well. Um, same thing in life, right? We don't have the um, capabilities of making our own outcome exactly how we want it. There's so many different variables out there that it essentially just doesn't, it's impossible. So 
being that really, really strict parent can lead to the feelings of, if I had to be flexible, if the child had to be flexible, then it's a feeling of anxiousness. I don't know. Like, like. Also, um, sorry, I just put my brain around. Um, Kids who have strict parents um, often feel like failures, that they're never, never good enough. Uh, often with strict parents, there isn't really a sense of um, security um, because there's always um, the feeling that um, I have, or that the children have to be this person, succeed as this person, and anything that isn't what my what their parents want um, is essentially a failure. And for me, uh, I was raised in a very, very in most aspects it was pretty strict. In some aspects, um, it was a little bit more lenient. But for me. Um, Essentially, the thing that my parents want me to, to um, succeed in, they want me to succeed in everything school, but it was, most of my time was spent in sports. Um, and it was never really my choice. When I was essentially three and a half, I started playing tennis because my brother was already at tennis courts and I would always have to watch and wait around for him. So my parents were like, oh, well, if he's there, then why don't you just like, why uh, so I started when I was three and a half, and you can imagine a three or a half year old child does not have any, they don't really have an opinion yet. Um, I think opinions like um, where your thought process kind of differs from your parents, or starts to differ from your parents, it's like around age six or seven. It's like when your sense of self kind of starts to come into place around six or seven. But before that, you really don't have a sense of self. Your sense of self is tied to your parents. So whatever your parents are wanting or doing or for the most part, um, with a few exceptions, um, that is what you are going to do. And a lot of times, these you know, parents in general, um, when their kids are that young, they essentially, you know, they don't really have any feedback with the children. So it's hard to know for them what could be improved on, what could be um, uh, essentially, you know, it's very hard for them to, to change. Um, but I digress. Um, so I started playing tennis when I was three and a half. I started my first tournament when I was five. And when I was five, right, so well six, like I didn't know I didn't I don't think I even decided that I want to play this tournament. Um uh, like a U other seven tournament. And um my dad put me in it and I remember that day um, I was still learning how to keep score and all that. And during my first match, uh, I was playing against a, a good player for our party. She was probably just a little bit better than me, but since I didn't know how to keep score, uh, he essentially cheated. Um, he changed up the score. Uh, I was young, so I don't really remember too much, but I just remember just the feeling of coming off that court it just feels like a failure. Both that I wasn't able to win, but also that I was cheated out of it. I remember I was crying so much because of that. And um, really, I was you know, way too young, and it felt like I had this pressure put on by my parents to succeed. And that success was deemed as winning, and you know, I lost. I didn't succeed. And so I had this really, really intense sense of dread that uh, just 
this made me not want to play. And at that time, I didn't know that. At that time, it was called, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm a loser, I'm a failure. Okay. But when I was getting older, I don't know, that disdain for, for winning and playing and all that stuff just kind of kept growing and growing. Um, I remember a few times I would think that I was tired and so that I didn't have to go to private lessons, um, that they could stop early. Um, I was essentially, I think at seven I started playing tennis like five days a week or at least an hour, sometimes two hours. And I didn't really have the sense of, you know, having fun or having that sense of break or enjoyment or with friends and stuff like that. That's a, that's a key one that sometimes um, people with tiger or children and tiger parents, very strict parents, is that their sense of, of friends and um, community is, kind of squashed because they're so busy with succeeding and doing well. Um, most of those succeedings and doing well um, activities are by themselves. So a lot of um, kids that are going through um, parenting or going through childhood that strict parents um, don't have that sense of you know, being able to feel okay around people and grow relationships and friendships. Um, very much their self-worth is tied around not how many friends that they have, but how many um, accomplishments they have. And that was essentially me uh, through, you know, let's say, you know, from age six to 12. Um, I won many tournaments. I was top, I want to say top 40 in Ontario for my age group in tennis. And when I was 12, at that end of the year, I think I was 11 at the time, but um, the Ontario Provincials for tennis for, for, or for the under 12 was happening in the summertime. And I was like, I'm done after that. I don't want to play any more tennis, I don't feel like I enjoy it. And this was after a few years of really not enjoying it. I just didn't have like that courage. My parents were so blind to the fact that I didn't like what I was doing that I just kept playing tennis and feeling shitty, essentially. Um, and it wasn't until that year where it was just like, man, there's there's no, there's no way that I want to do this anymore. Um, kind of like that identity was developing. It took all the way to age 12 for my parents to be like, oh, okay, yeah, he's, he's done. But it wasn't that I was done sports. It essentially just meant I transferred over to a different sport. I started playing volleyball, uh, which was better because it was a team sport, but just the, the sense of pressure was just so much. And it wasn't ever, um, for a lot of it, it was actually my, like, mostly my dad. My mom was more complacent with um, how my dad was parenting me and the way that sports was um, kind of viewed at um, in the family. Um, it was mostly my dad that really had that push. Uh, on me that really pushed me to do well in these things and I remember after one tournament I can't remember how old I was but we, we went over to my grandmother's house I think she watched um, maybe she didn't I'm not sure but I remember going in and then she either congratulating me or asking me you know saying it's okay and stuff like that and then my dad essentially chimes in and says no he didn't do well no, he was, no, no, could have done a lot better. And I just remember seeing the back and forth because that's his, that's his mother. And just that back and forth saying like, no, no, this is not, like he did well. Uh, it's like, no, he did He could have done this, that, and that, and that. And it's sometimes that sense of, 
um, when uh, when really strict parents, when they parent your children, they have the sense of a goal that they want their children to achieve, and they kind of lose the aspect of, well, is it really necessary for them to achieve that goal? So when I was younger, it was all about succeeding in sports, not so much getting good grades. I still need to get good grades, but there are a lot of things that uh, transferred over, like the, the um, getting the like, super perfect mark wasn't there, but there was stuff like writing for me. When I was younger, writing was so dang hard. Writing my thoughts down, writing about stories, or writing about um, uh, an event, or something like that. Essentially getting my thoughts down on people who were impossible, because I was always sneaky as a child, that if it wasn't perfect, why would I write it down? If it wasn't good enough, if my parent, if essentially my dad being my brain, said, if it's not good enough, don't ever do it. Or it has to be this good before you do it. Um, and so ever since I was in grade one, I'd be terrified to write down any words because the fear of it not being perfect was the fear of failing. And it turned into failing in my mind. But the problem was my dad didn't see it that way. My dad didn't see it as, oh, he can't put words down on the page because he's having this intense anxiety about it being perfect. No, no, no. It's because he was being lazy. And I have distinct memories of my dad essentially uh, yelling at me for not being able to write anything down. We were on vacation once in uh, uh, South Carolina uh, at a resort. And my homework through that because it was, I think, an extended book for Christmas break was to write about what happened during Christmas break. And I had to write maybe six, seven sentences, something like that. And I just couldn't. And every single time that I was left alone, I had that tense, intense anxiety that I wasn't good enough, that I needed to write something down that was spectacular, that was amazing. And because of that, I wasn't able to write anything down. But every single time that my dad would come back into the room and see that I haven't written anything down, I'd get yelled at which would give me even more anxiety towards the writing and it not being good enough, in the sense of feeling like a failure. Because I was feeling like I was a failure, my writing was a failure, so I couldn't write anything down on the page because I was a failure. And just that sense of that strictness and that pressure to succeed, I wasn't able to essentially write effectively in my brain um, until it's still hard. It's still hard. Uh, it's it for a lot of assignments, a lot of writing stuff that's uh, that I don't. That's not for me. I can only do those um, projects if there's a time crunch. If there is the fear of failing for me for the time that I won't be able to hand it in. When that gets too big and I feel like I'm not going to get there in time because I've procrastinated so much, then I start it because the fear of failing that way is much stronger than the fear of failing um, while writing it. So there's a lot of, when it comes to parenting um, and being a strict parent, um, it's, it's hard to distinguish um, it's hard for the, the child to distinguish between um, themselves as people and their actions or their activities or their successes and stuff like that. There's when you're when you're children, that's essentially the same. Um, how you parents view you? Oh, that's how, what reality is. And it's not when you get into older, it's when you 
actually get your own views of um, what is right or wrong or succeeding or failing, but if there's so much pressure put on them in the early stages of life, then that essentially comes into trauma for the, their children to, to succeed or the fear of failing. And for a lot of parents, there's no budging in what the end goal is. Um, and it kind of comes, comes to the ideas like, you know, a family, or you know, back in the old days, back, you know, the hunter-gatherer days, families or community was essentially um, the woman of the tribe would take care of the home and take care of the children while the men would go out and hunt and gather food and stuff like that. And there would be um, the sense of if there was a predator around that everyone would band together and help out each other so they could all stay alive, that they all could thrive and feel good in another case, succeed. But when it comes to strict parents, um, that sense of safety is, can really be gone, especially when it happens really young. Um, because when you live in an environment that um, doesn't accept who you are, where you are um, at that time, they're always pushing for like, oh, you can do this better, or oh, you can do that better. Then home doesn't really become safe. Home becomes a scary place that you never know um, if who you are or what you do is enough. That's a big thing. It's, if you don't feel like you are enough, you don't have a lot of self-esteem. It's a really big problem. Um, if you do think you're enough, if you think that if you wake up and you exist and that is enough, you get enough love in that way from your parents, we call that unconditional love, um, then if you have a bad day, if, if things don't go well, if um, you fail in whatever way that is, you have these people to go back on, your family, say like, okay, I can reset, I can restart, I'm okay. I can also ask for help. And for myself, I never wanted to ask for help from my parents because I would always fear the reaction to whatever I'm asking. I would always feel judgment for whatever I'm asking or whatever I'm struggling with. So I wouldn't feel safe with placing my opinions or my needs because, well, that might not be, you know, uh, okay with them. So it can be hard with safety and like having that safety net. And when you're a child, like you spend a lot more time with your family than when you get older. So if during that point in time, a lot of times, if you don't feel safe with your parents, then it could be that the parents are putting too much pressure on the children. That was for me. It never felt when I was younger that I could have a great day. It was always like, oh, I gotta do something. Like playing video games for a few hours, like I couldn't do that. Like that was not bettering myself. That's actually a, a key a, a phrase, bettering myself, that I used to say all the time, like, I have to spend the weekend bettering myself, whether that means if I'm working out or if I'm participating in something, I have to better myself. And that bettering came when I was younger. It was kind of tied towards winning. Um, but the whole thing with safety is that safety comes with listening. Uh, the parents listening to their children. 
feeling heard, that's a big thing. There's no safety in where you are unless you feel heard, unless you feel secure about who you are, what you're thinking, and what you're doing. And for me, um, I've never had that with my parents. Um, with my mom, it was always passive. It was always like, uh, she never really yelled or, or disagreed, but there was a sense of disconnect that I would say something or, or feel something and she would understand. My dad on the opposite hand would be an aggressive type, where if he didn't understand, he would voice his opinions and it wouldn't really turn out um, well. And I was looking back the other day, because I love going back to my old stuff, and I was looking at an email that my dad sent to me in 2014, so this was when I was in grade seven, um, about not being motivated to practice um, playing tennis, um, not running to balls as fast, um, being slow, being bored, um, just overall being unfulfilled. And my dad had a conversation with the tennis pro that we had um, of you know what to do about that. And essentially at the end of it, my dad sent me an email saying, hey, if you're at tennis practice, you have to give 100% of your effort 100% of the time, no matter what. You gotta keep improving, you gotta focus on yourself and not who the person on the other side of the net is. And above all else, do it with a smile. And when I was reading that, it kind of took me back to, you know, when I was like younger and just all that, like I never had my feelings validated. Um, many times my dad would say, oh, you know, if I was crying or feeling bad, just, look, just smile, just smile, it'll be all better. But, I was kind of, at that time, like I was just unable to voice what my emotions were. Um, and to feel heard. It was just absolutely impossible to um, have my feelings, to feel secure because I wasn't supposed to feel. I was supposed to, essentially in my words, when I was a lot younger, it's essentially supposed to be like a robot winning these championships for the uh, social status of my parents. Uh, many a times I would try to downplay my successes because I wouldn't want them to post on Facebook and other uh, sites uh, my successes because it never felt like my successes. It felt, a lot of the time, it felt like I was just doing well so that they could succeed socially or they could feel better about themselves. I was almost like a pawn in their game. And it kind of destroyed me in my sense of uh, security because I couldn't trust them on anything really. Emotions wise, um, opinion wise, and still to this day, I don't trust them when it comes to my emotions or my opinions. I figured out how to deal with that, but um, I just can't really, you know, be around them because the pressure was so high when I was younger. The residual um, feelings of pressure is still there. When I was, when I was still playing tennis, and, and still now, like when I do running races, when I go do Spartan races, and when I was younger, when I played in other tennis tournaments or volleyball tournaments, or especially in tennis, I would tell my dad, don't come to the courts. Stay away, stay as far as possible so I don't see your face. Because when I see your face, because your face is so expressive, I feel instantly bad about myself because right, we take negative feelings so much more harsh than positive feelings. 
So I would, you know, if I did tennis, I would hit a bad shot, I would lose a point, I just feel a loss or something like that. And I'd look over and I'd just see my dad just arms crossed, scowling, and it just made me feel like shit. It was terrible. And it got to the point where I couldn't even look at my dad. I didn't want him there because there was just the anxiety of his presence that made me not want to be there. That made me not want to succeed. And it was very hard to kind of let them back into that. Um, like, I still, when I heard there's a, a, something I want to do or succeed events or something like that, I don't ask my parents to come. Because even though they're a lot more supportive and they've said that, yeah, they've made mistakes in the past, I don't feel secure around them. I still don't feel secure or, um, being around them because the pressure from be the before is still there. Even though they don't apply that pressure, I feel that pressure. And it's interesting when it comes to um, the high pressure parents. Um, Strict parents usually have a vision of how they want their kids to succeed. And it's interesting that um, most often than not, um, the need for the, their children to succeed um, comes from the lack of feeling of success from themselves. Um, like for example, like my parents don't really show it. On the outside, uh, they kind of mask it with different motions, but they're very insecure about themselves. My dad's very insecure about his output and him not being worthy enough. And my mom is very insecure about um, not doing it enough for the family around the house. Um, their whole worth is tied around output um, rather than the output or the outcome rather than the journey itself. And for that, they've pushed that on to, to me and my brother that we also have to be outcome driven. That we have to succeed at the highest level so that, you know, if they succeed at the highest level, maybe I'm doing something right. In a quantifying say like, yeah, I'm parenting right. Um, but it's interesting because a lot of parents want their children to, to succeed in life. And that's a really interesting um, idea because what is success in life? A lot of people deem success as you know, just being happiness. That if I feel happy most of the time, or more than the average, that I have succeeded in life. And for a lot of it, that is valid. Um, on the flip side, a lot of people feel like if I'm succeeding in life, that means that I have um, done the most I can do. That means I've climbed the corporate ladder. That means I've helped as many people as possible. That's how I've made so much money. Um, it's really tied to effort equals reward rather than reward is co like comes from existence. So it, it's an interesting idea because both sides, both extremes would be really bad for the person themselves. If the person wanted to be, and its complete goal was to be happy all the time, and that they were happy all the time, they wouldn't have any motivation to do the tough things in life, to you know, ask that girl on that date or take that chance with that job um, opportunity, or um, I don't know, say, I don't know. It's interesting. Um, if they're always happy, they're not having these negative feelings or these anxious feelings. And by the way, anxious feelings are really good. Um, in, in manageable quantities, Anxiety actually helps us make decisions and guide us through our day. Um, 
a lot of the time, like we don't think of anxiety as something that helps us make decisions, but something like deciding what to eat for breakfast, you essentially weigh all the different possibilities in your head and you pick the one that you think will lead you to be the most nourished, the least anxious nutritionally. Um, a little bit of a stretch, but um, anxiety just helps us make decisions that I've got to make the best decision in this case so I can be, have the best opportunity or um, for the next thing to, to be set up um, the best that it can be. Um, so, especially young people um, who aren't dependent on, or who are dependent on family and not their families are dependent on them, um, the sense of uh, being a high output um, person, the idea of that is somewhat hard. Um, you rarely see a six, eight, ten year old starting their own business and making money, right? Because that's an adult thing to do. That's something that you do when you have to defend for yourselves. And we talked about the hunter gatherer. If you're defending for yourself, then that means you're finding your own tribe and you're old enough to lead the community, the tribe. So when you're younger, it's really um, being that high output is not necessary because you're learning. But when you get older, this is the crux of it. Um, Having that high output means that high output takes energy. When we talk about that, helping other people, making money, that takes energy. And the only way that we can expend that energy is the fear of doing something else um, is greater than using up the energy to do the um, activity that um, we're striving for. So having a low self-esteem um, will lead to, in most cases, higher productivity to a point, to a point. Let's say we're on an exchange, you have no self-esteem. That's usually what we call you know, depression or something like that, where you, nothing will be good enough. If nothing's good enough, just like my writing, I'm not writing anything down. So if nothing's good enough, you will not, you won't do uh, you won't output what you need to output. Likewise, if you have super high self-esteem, then that could lead to being very very self-centered um, and just essentially helping yourself without helping other people, uh, which could cause a lot of problems and not a lot of parents want their children to be completely self-centered, completely um, just only helping themselves. And so having somewhere in that middle where you don't have high self-esteem, but like medium self-esteem leads to where you're able to, if you need to, if there's a tough situation and you need to get through it, you'll be able to deal with the outcome that presents itself. And at the same time, when you have the ability to go out there and feel fulfilled, to do the thing in life that matters to you, there's still that sense of failing, but it's not paralyzing. And it's good. And when it's not paralyzing, that means that you can break down those walls uh, and those fears and then grow as an individual. So having that balance, or parents, having that balance, say like, yes, 